Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Greetings from Forney, Texas, where we are recording today's podcast from my home. We're excited to continue the second part in a four-part podcast series on the grand narrative of Scripture. And to do so, I welcome back to the podcast studio my friend and colleague, Dr. Scott Keene. Dr. Keene is the Academic Dean of Online Education for Ethnos 360, formerly known to many of our listeners as New Tribes Mission. Dr. Keene has a Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Ministries from Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. He has a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies from Dallas Theological Seminary, and he holds a Doctor of Ministry also from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's working on his second doctorate, a Ph.D. in Bible Exposition. Dr. Keene is also an instructor here at Dallas Theological Seminary, and one of the courses that he teaches here at DTS is called The Story of Scripture. Dr. Keene teaches a similar course for Ethnos 360 Bible Institute entitled The Grand Narrative of Scripture, which is also the name of this podcast series. Dr. Keene, welcome back to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. It's a privilege to be here with you today. By way of review, in our last podcast, we discussed the overarching plot line from Genesis to Revelation. In today's program, we're going to narrow our focus and look at a section of the grand narrative of Scripture, specifically the storyline found in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. We're going to focus on the literary evidence for the identification of a plot line in the Pentateuch and the moving of that plot line forward. If you are joining us today and missed the last podcast, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it first, and then return to join us for this one, since today's podcast will be built upon the foundation that was laid last week. Dr. Keene, please remind our listeners what function the setting has in a narrative and help us to identify this in the Pentateuch. Okay, so when literary scholars look at the way narrative functions, they recognize that the setting of a story is basically doing what it's named. It sets the stage for that which follows. It it provides the necessary background to understand the events and details that occur within the story. And a lot of times, I think pretty much every time, the setting introduces the ideal because it shows you the protagonist, the hero, and what the hero wants to accomplish. And so through that, then it gives you the lens through which the rest of the story should be understood. And you could think of it this way. If you're watching a movie and you walk into the room and it's been going for about 10 minutes, your reaction is to ask someone next to you, what did I miss? Mm -hmm. Because you realize if I don't have this, I'm really not equipped to understand the story. And in fact, sometimes we can very much misunderstand the story if we don't know what the setting is. Mm -hmm. So that's what it does in a story. Protagonist and antagonist. Can you... Yeah, clarify. Hero and villain, good guy and the bad guy. Dr. Charles Bayless, who's now with the Lord, he pointed out always that the hero in the story is the one that's presented with the problem that they have to fix. And of course, in the story of Scripture, the one who has a problem that they have to fix is God. And God didn't create the problem. He created man who sinned against him and gave us the problem. So God's not the author of sin? Not the author of sin. Not at all. He's removed from that. I'll invite you back next week to the podcast. That's great. So Adam is not the protagonist. Adam is not the protagonist. And what you find really is that when you go through these stories, for example, I think that's a shift that we make because growing up in Sunday school, we read about David and he's the hero or Noah's the hero or David's the hero. And when you look at the text of Scripture closely, you realize there are no heroes except Mm. the Lord. Very good. So let me just look at Genesis 1 and 2 for a second with you and talk about how we see the setting here in the biblical story. And what I see here is you're introduced to the hero in the beginning, God. And you also discern that which God wants to accomplish. Okay, and you see the nature and character of God. God is a sovereign God. God is a God of power and authority. 
For example, God said, let there be, and it was. And you get this statement over and over in Genesis 1. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. So he's powerful. He creates by the power of his word. You also see that there's a goal towards which creation is moving. And when you reach that goal, it's signified by this statement. This won't be a surprise. It is very good. Mm. God says it's good, it's good, Mm -hmm. it's good. It's very good. Mm. Some have noted you've got these kind of panels here on day one. God separates the light from the darkness. On day four, he creates lights for the day and night. On day two, he creates the sea and the sky. On day five, he makes creatures to fill the sea and the sky. Mm. On day three, there's this fertile ground. On day six, there's creatures for the fertile earth. Mm. And so there's a direction that God is moving, but then the climax of the creation account separated in a sense. It's on the sixth day, but it's separate. God says, let us make man Mm -hmm. in our image and likeness and let them rule. And so this shows you where God is moving. Now, Mm -hmm. Eugene Merrill said this. He says, after all things else had been made and put into their several positions of function and interrelationship, the Lord said, let us make man as our image. Mm -hmm. They will rule the significance of this for communicating a, if not the major theme of Old Testament theology cannot be overstated. And where Dr. Merrill is going, of course, the title of his book, Everlasting Dominion, this is the theme of the kingdom, and it comes out of Genesis chapter 1. So that's then the ideal, the setting, and God's pronouncement over this shows me that the trajectory is now in place. God's kingdom on the earth with his desire that it would spread over the globe. Now, it doesn't get there before something very bad happens, but you get this pronouncement. It's very good. That's where God is taking history. So if we're concerned with a unifying theme through scripture, probably the kingdom. Yep. It's right there in chapter one, verses 26, 28. It's it's, it's before the fall. It's before the fall, and it's there after the new creation, Mm -hmm. mankind reigning on the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you don't need the salvation of mankind till you have the fall. Absolutely. God and his grace and his determination to have man to reign on the earth, that's why Christ comes as a man to die for us so that we could get to reign with him again. So he goes there. So salvation is a very important topic, very important theme in scripture, but it's to get to where we want to go. It is. And Dr. Weaver, it's kind of awkward because I've said this before with lots of qualifications so as not to offend that the cross and the empty tomb is a means to an end. Mm. It shows us the depth of God's love that he Mm. would do that to bring us into glory, Mm -hmm. but he is concerned more than just forgiving our sins. It's a big topic. Yeah. And I, I've been highly influenced by Eugene Merrill as well and appreciate what he's written on this subject. Also in the biblical theology of the Old Testament edited by Zuck. This is so important. We've got to get this right. The purpose statement is given for us for human existence in Genesis 1, 26, 20, to rule as his image bearer. Absolutely, yeah. So this is huge. And I'll give you one more quote. This is John Selhammer in the Pentateuch's narrative. Behind the shape of the narrative lies a clear theological program. First, he intends to draw a line connecting the God of the fathers and the God of the Sinai covenant. That's important. The God of Israel is the God who made heaven and earth. But second, he intends to show that the call of the patriarchs and the Sinai covenant have as their ultimate goal the reestablishment of God's original purpose in creation. What he's saying here is that Genesis 1 is bigger than just explaining how we got here. Mm -hmm. It's showing us the goal. Dr. Merrill elsewhere calls it the blueprint of creation. Mm -hmm. Like This is the template where God is moving history towards. Mm -hmm. Great way to start our program. In our first episode in this series, Dr. Keene, you talked about an initial conflict. Can you tell our listeners about the function of the initial conflict in narrative literature, generally speaking, and how you see that reflected in the Pentateuch specifically? So actually, I'm going to go there in just a second, Genesis 3, but I want you to notice how narrative works. And we know this intuitively again, but think about this, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. And I read that and I'm like, why did he say that? Mm. And it almost like creates this, uh uh-oh, could this happen? That's narrative. It introduces a tiny bit of tension into the story. 
when I come to Genesis chapter 3, I get this initial conflict. And this is this event that happens that upsets the status of the setting. It leaves things, as C.S. Lewis said, where it did not find them. We're also introduced to the antagonist or the enemy. And of course, in chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And then, this is powerful here, in verse 4, it says, You surely will not die. But Mm. in the Hebrew text, it's more emphatic than that. Mm. Not, you will die. He's being presented by Moses here in the narrative of Genesis. Of course, this is a true story. But he's presenting it in a certain way because he wants the reader to catch. This is the enemy. He is attacking the character Mm -hmm. of God. He's undermining the plan of God. So this is an initial conflict. Now, what happens here, this is very interesting. Because when God created, God said, and it was good, Tov. And it was good, Tov. It was good. God is the one who determines what's good and what's not good. What you find with the woman in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was tov, good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes and it was desirable to make one wise, she took from the fruit and ate and gave also to her husband who was with her and he ate. And what you have here is that now the woman decides for herself that which is good. She is undermining the authority of God. She joins side with the enemy. And so this is a reversal of God's order, and it's an attack on God's creation purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let me share a quote here just to talk about this reversal. This, again, came from Dr. Merrill and Everlasting Dominion. The order of authority was disregarded. He says, what was at stake in man's temptation and fall was the very thing under consideration here, namely the question of kingdom hierarchical authority. To portray it in any other way is to lose side of the central issue of the Bible, namely, who indeed is God and how does everything else relate to him? The serpent usurped the role of the man who after all had named him. And then the man, having succumbed, usurped the role of God. So everything gets messed up here. It's an attack on God's order. Mm. And then you have in Genesis 3.14, and this is still part of this scene of the initial conflict, but you have the plan articulated. And you don't get a ton of details here, and it doesn't become clear until we move through the story. But whatever got messed up, God's creation purposes, his intentions, the direction he was moving the story, got messed up by the serpent. And God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Okay, so we're looking at offspring, but then we focus in on a single offspring. He shall bruise you, the serpent, not the seed of the serpent. He shall bruise you on Mm. the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is it. We have locked in the plot line. God Mm. has determined that he is going to respond to the initial conflict. The hero is confronted with the problem. He's going to fix this through the seed of the woman. And the question that remains and the plot line is going to develop, will God have a kingdom on the earth? Will it be filled with mankind who worships him as God, or is Satan going to be the God of this world? Scott, in our first session, you said that there's a an essential characteristic of a narrative. We can use the Latin word sine qua non. The essential characteristic or essential sine qua non is the development of a plot line. Do we find a plot development in the Pentateuch? And if so, where do we see it and what is it? Yeah, okay, this is great. So, for example, like some would look at Genesis 3, 14 and 15, and this enmity between the woman and the serpent. They would see that as an etiology. It's explaining Mm -hmm. why people are scared of snakes. That's what etiology means. Yes, just explaining why something is the way it is. And if Genesis was an etiology, then I would expect that to be the end of this. Right. When I come to Genesis 4, the very next story, this is just like the next scene in this unfolding drama, is this enmity between Cain and Abel. And of course, we have the vantage point of looking from the New Testament perspective. We're not reading into the Old Testament, but we've seen the whole movie now. And so those earlier scenes make more sense to us. First John says that the reason that Cain killed Abel is that he, Cain's deeds were wicked Mm -hmm. and his brothers were righteous and Cain was of that wicked one. Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding here is that immediately the storyline continues and there's a contrast of seed lines in Genesis 5 and 6 and onward. So that's part of the plot development. So etiology, again, those that are not inerrantists, don't believe the Bible's the word of God, kind of see these things in Genesis 
to say is just explaining why we don't like serpents. That's it. And the problem with that, of course, there are others that would hold the etiology that would be sure. conservative evangelicals. But here's the influence. If I'm looking at historical criticism and I'm trying to get behind the text and understand the history of the text and all that, I'm missing the literary function of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is what Leland Riken has said and many others, that there was a problem here where people started dissecting the text and they weren't able to put it back together. We're looking at the text as a completed work and we're giving God the benefit of the doubt. And what we're finding here is like, wow, if I just read this as an unfolding narrative the way it's intended to be read, I can detect those plot lines being mm -hmm. developed all over the place. Well, let's talk about the Toledot. So, Toledot. So another another literary feature that I see in Genesis that shows a plot line is what we call the Toledot structure. Toledot is a Hebrew word, and it just simply is translated sometimes as this is the book of the generations of Alan Ross, who wrote a commentary on Genesis that's really an important work there. He says the best way to translate it is this is what became of. Mm. And the reason that's important is you start with Toledot, and the whoever person or event that's named in that Toledot, it doesn't focus on them. It starts there and it goes, what became of them? Mm. Well, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 is not a Toledot. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning. Right. God created the heavens and the earth. This is his plan. It's the setting. It's the setting. So then what became of God's creation? Well, Genesis 2, verse 4 actually picks that up and it gives us the Toledot of heavens and earth. What became of that? Okay, and this is interesting. So it goes from 2, 4 to 4, 26. And I won't read all the scripture references. I'll just name these. But I just want you to catch the quick movement here. The first Toledot traces the descendants of Adam through Cain's line for seven generations. And it's this downward spiral of things getting bad. But then it ends in hope by calling attention to Seth and mm -hmm. the people calling on the name of the Lord. Genesis 5, 1 through 6, 8. This is like what precipitates the flood, and it goes from bad to worse. It goes seven generations from Seth's line until it ends in hope by noting that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But here's the picture. The sons of God, they were even messed up, mm -hmm. okay? And so now God's is like, the only thing I can do to fix this is start all over again. And this is beautiful. God the sons of God, it, we think, are angels, the fallen angels, typically. Well, that's one view. The other view would be the line of Seth. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Because here's the deal. Either it was the line of Seth and the godly line was messed up and now mm -hmm. we have no hope. Or if it is fallen angels and it corrupts humanity, mm -hmm. then you can't have the seed of the woman. So either way, mm -hmm. I think either view would fit with the storyline. But it ends in hope by noting that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Then you have the Toledot of Noah, Genesis 6, 9 through 9, 29. And it ends in hope by showing that God's going to be connected with the line of Shem. So basically what you have with these Toledotes after Noah is that you look at the non-elect line and then you trace the elect line. And this happens with the other sons of Noah. And then we look at the line of Shem. It looks at Terah. Now that takes you to Abraham. Then we go back to the non-elect line, Ishmael. Then we look at Isaac. Then we close the door on Esau. Then we go to Jacob. And what he's doing here, he doesn't give equal air time, but he's basically saying, what happened to that other guy that God didn't choose? Mm -hmm. And he shuts the door on that before he goes ahead with the chosen line. And so what he's doing, he's always advancing the ball down the field, mm -hmm. moving back to where we started, moving towards this kingdom. From the line in Genesis 3.15, the, the seed the yes, woman. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we pick this up because you have Genesis 3.15, seed of the woman. And then God says to Abraham, in your seed, all nations will be blessed. We're looking at a seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Genesis 49 brings it to Judah, mm -hmm. which is huge. And we'll come back to that after a while. But just seeing there's this trajectory here of we're waiting on this one to come. And so mm -hmm. there's evidence of a plot line in Genesis. Mm. Are there any other aspects of the plot developed here? I mean, you also have the negative side. And what I mean by that is if you have the seed of the woman, you also have the seed of the serpent. Mm -hmm. And you have, for example, like this curse upon the serpent in Genesis 3. You have cursed be Canaan in Genesis 9. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to that as well. You just have this picture of nations in view with the Edomites and the Israelites and God's work through Israel. So it seems like there's this contrast of the mm -hmm. people who believe the promises and yeah. those who don't. So those who are God-fearers and those who are joining 
Satan's team, mm-hmm. we might put it that way. Yep, and that plays out. You know, this is another topic, but you know, I did a study on this recently looking for literary, strong literary connections, and you see this all through the Pentateuch built upon by the prophets and the writings. So it's it's validated. And so whose team is Cain on? Cain is on the bad guys. He's the seed of the serpent. In just a moment, we'll return to our previously recorded program, but now our missions moment of the week. Today we'll be hearing from Rachel in the country of Lebanon, who is a graduate of the National Theological College and Graduate School, also known as NTCGS. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel, I'm from Lebanon. I have started to study theology at NTCGS four years ago. I started with very little biblical knowledge, but after four years of study, NTCGS has gave me a clear and biblical understanding of the Christian doctrines. Now I have a solid biblical foundation and ready to defend my faith in Jesus and talk about the reason of my hope. Now in my ministry, I'm leading many groups of Bible study. They are ladies from Muslim background, also Christian ladies coming from ritual churches, and I give them Bible study lessons. I also give counseling sessions for women who are suffering, who are facing many problems in their family or in their society, in their surroundings. I encourage you to support NTCGS because they are doing a great job in glorifying God and in giving students a solid knowledge about Jesus and about the scripture. The National Theological College and Graduate School is a strategically placed school with three campuses in the Middle East and one in East Africa. To learn more about how you can partner with NTCGS in equipping future leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ, like Rachel, in Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and East Africa, please visit ntcgs.org. That's ntcgs.org. Org. Now, let's return to our previously recorded conversation. Well, Dr. Keene, please explain to our listeners the significance of the Abrahamic covenant in the unfolding of this narrative. Okay, so this is interesting when you think about it. And this, to me, is another feature where I see Moses presenting this narrative in a tight fashion and doing it in a way that he's telling his readers to think back about what he's already said. And Moses is the author of all five books of the Pentateuch. Yes. And what you find here, for example, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you have Adam as God's man to carry out God's plan on the earth. He's under the blessing of God. He's told to be fruitful and multiply. And it's implied that he walked with God mm-hmm. because the Lord came to walk in the cool of you know, the day. Genesis chapter 9, you have a repeat of this language. Noah is God's man to carry out God's plan on the earth. I know that because God says he blesses him and he's told to be fruitful and multiply and Noah walked with God. Mm -hmm. So in saying that, Moses is saying, hey, reader, look back to Genesis 1. You see that we're doing this again? In fact, Mm -hmm. let me just say this. The flood is amazing here because if you look at the flood account and God said he's going to destroy man and beasts and all this, It's in reverse order of that which it was made in Genesis 1. Hmm. In the beginning, the earth was covered with the water. God puts it back underwater again. Mm -hmm. The flood is an uncreation. God hit the reset button. Mm said, I'm going to start all over again with Noah. Well, when you get off the boat, you find that Noah sins with the fruit of the vine. Mm Kind of seems like an Adam figure there. And not only that, but then humanity congregates together in the plains of Shinar. And instead of spreading out God's kingdom on the earth, It's this rebellious Mm -hmm. city, you know, against the Lord. And so God scatters them in judgment. So here's where the picture goes. Genesis 12, and this is the Abrahamic promise that becomes a covenant. Genesis 12, you have God's man to carry out God's plan on the earth. And God says in Genesis 12, verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. In you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So pause there for a second. The way that God's going to bring mankind back under this blessing, like we had in Genesis 1, it's through Abraham. Now, I love the change here, and it's subtle, but it's huge. In Genesis 1 with Adam, Genesis 9 with Noah, God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. In Genesis 12, God says, I will cause you to multiply. 
And so this is going to be a work of God. It's no longer contingent upon man's obedience. This is an unconditional promise here. It becomes a covenant. In Genesis 13 and 14 and 15, 15 is where the actual covenant ceremony is, God promises to give this land to Abraham and his descendants forever. So that tells me that God is going to restore his creation purposes through this seed of Abraham And now the question is, are we talking about seed or seed? (laughs) Is it going to be singular or plural? This is an interesting dynamic into the storyline because what I see in Revelation is Israel is brought back to restoration and functioning as a kingdom of priests to the nations. Mm -hmm. So God's going to restore that. But the ultimate seed of Abraham is the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't Mm -hmm. replace Israel but he enables Israel to fulfill her calling as a kingdom of priests, and he brings us in along the way. Yeah. So that seed then is developed, and you have you know this Abrahamic covenant is huge. We're locked into Abraham. One other thing I'll say about that is that you go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and this covenant language is reiterated to each one to show that they're inheriting that, that mm-hmm. the baton is being passed. Well, I think one of the most important texts in scripture is in Genesis chapter 49 and I'll read this to us many would be familiar with this Genesis 49 and verse 10 the scepter which means the right to rule it's like saying the crown Mm -hmm. will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet depending on your translation until he comes to whom it belongs Mm -hmm. and to him a singular masculine singular And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Mm. So God's kingdom, and and by the way, when he goes on to describe this kingdom, he ties his foal and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. If anyone has ever gardened, they know that you never let animals get at your best vines. Mm. And the picture is the abundant blessing of the Judahite king's kingdom in which the nations are worshiping or obeying him, it is described in terminology that reminds the reader of the blessing of creation. So this focus is becoming narrow as we move through the storyline. So Genesis 3.15, seed. Genesis 12.15, seed. Yep. Land, seed, and blessing. But seed is very important seed to is moving important. this plot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Genesis, as you mentioned, 49 ends with the coming seed, right? So yeah, it's absolutely. foreshadowing what's to come. And obviously looking back, we know that's referring to the Messiah. And you'll get this language used in like Psalm 72 about Solomon and the Davidic kingdom. Mm-hmm. It's showing that he's in the line. This mm-hmm. is where we're going. Right. From and then Judah. of course, yeah, from Judah. David's from Judah. And so is the Messiah. Yep, absolutely. Dr. Keen, prior to the fall of man... We saw a kingdom in Eden, a microcosm kingdom there, right? Can you tell us how the book of Exodus through Deuteronomy relate to this? Yeah, so I'm going to just grab the language here of Alva J. McLean nice. and his concept of the kingdom with a ruler, a realm of subjects, and the exercise of this rulership. And of course, you see this at creation, the beginnings, and it's supposed to spread over the earth. But when I'm going into Exodus through Deuteronomy, I'm building, of course, on Genesis. And I need to remember that Moses, when he wrote the Pentateuch under the inspiration of the Spirit, he knew where he was going to go in Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. He knew what the whole thing was. So so I'm reading Genesis knowing where the rest right. of the Pentateuch is going. In Genesis 1, man is created to rule in God's stead, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and so when that kingdom got messed up with the fall of man, if you think about this, the call of Abraham, we're told, I think in Genesis 17, kings would come from Abraham. Mm -hmm. So God was never opposed to having a king. The issue with Saul was the type of king that they wanted. So God wants to have this king. So to go back to this, then you've got unresolved conflict in the story of scripture. It's the seed of the woman that's going to destroy the serpent. And I think by implication also restore God's kingdom. You have God's association with the line of Shem in Genesis chapter 9 and the dominance of the Shemites over the Canaanites. Okay, now I know we're talking Exodus through Deuteronomy, but we got to look at Genesis 9 one more time here. Genesis 9, this is a prophetic statement by Noah. He said, Cursed be Canaan, not Cain, not Ham, but Canaan. Mm -hmm. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be his servant. And so what you have here in Genesis 9 is the subjugation of the Canaanites to the Shemites. That's significant. 
another thing that comes into play here, we talked about Abrahamic covenant, that God was going to give this land to Abraham and his descendants forever, but he says not yet because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. So the conquest is going to be this judgment, and it's going to be the Canaanites being possessed by the Shemites. So with all that being said, we've got to get moving towards the land. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're still wandering about this promised land in tents with no inheritance except right. a burial plot. We don't have a nation, really, even until they go down. We have a, Eugene a people, Merrill yeah. says a, a family goes down to, to, to Egypt and a nation comes out. Absolutely. Yeah. Got to have a constitution, right? Yeah. So we get that in Exodus. So what you find then when you come into Exodus, I'll be kind of quick on this, but this is pretty cool. You get an abbreviated account of Genesis 46, that registry of people that went to Egypt, you get an abbreviated account of that in Exodus 1. So he's tying together the narratives. Another thing he does is that in Exodus chapter 1 verse 7, Moses wants you to see that God's doing with Israel what he did in the creation account. God said in the creation account to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. In Exodus chapter 1 verse 7, the sons of Israel were fruitful they multiplied greatly, literally, and they became exceedingly mighty. And what you have here is, and they also, by the way, filled the land, mm -hmm. the earth, the Eretz. And so you get the same language of Genesis 128, mm -hmm. and he's showing you like, hey, we're yeah. doing this again with Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's huge. And then you get God's intervention with Moses, and he does this because he heard the groanings of his people, and he remembered the Abrahamic mm -hmm. covenant. So it's connected with what God was doing there in the past. When God sends Moses to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Right. And Dr. Merrill, again, he talks about how really it's a contest of who has the right to rule the earth. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh thinks he's God, mm -hmm. and God says, no, I'm God. And what the plagues do they are a demonstration of God's authority when he judges the gods of Egypt, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. And through this account, I love this, over and over again, God says that all the world may know that I alone am God. Mm -hmm. So God's making a name for himself. He is showing that he is the Lord by delivering his people, by sending judgment upon the Egyptians. And he brings them out, and he enters a covenant with them at Sinai. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Keene, you just touched on this some, but please elaborate further. How does the Mosaic Covenant and the tabernacle relate to this kingdom, this kingdom theme that is part of this storyline, the narrative of Scripture? Okay, that's good. So one thing I want to point out is in Exodus 15, we just crossed the Red Sea. We're fresh out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 17 Actually, I'll go to verse 15. The chiefs of Edom were dismayed. This is a song. The leaders of Moab trembling grips them, and the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them by the greatness of your arm. So first of all, he's portraying this great fear, and you get that with the Moabites and the Edomites and the Canaanites. This is the pathway into the promised land. So everybody sees God coming, and they're like looking for a rock to hide mm -hmm. under. They're yes. terrified. And where God is going with this, verse 17, you will bring them, talking about Israel, and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling. So God's going to dwell with this nation, just like he did Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And then verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Mm. Now, if I'm just reading that and I don't have the rest of Exodus, it's probably going to be a little bit mysterious. But when I come to Exodus 19 and God makes the covenant with Israel, and it takes a few chapters to be completed here mm -hmm. and the ceremony and all that. But God says that Israel will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation unto him. So God's going to have this nation that's going to represent him mm -hmm. to the other nations. They're going to mediate his message, his blessing. That's this kingdom of priests. But, you know, think about this. In the garden, you had God's kingdom in this special little epicenter, this mm -hmm. garden in Eden. Not just Eden, but inside of Eden, there was a garden. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to spread out from there over the earth. God places a special people in a special land, Canaan, the promised land, and they're going to mediate his blessing to the nations, mm -hmm. ideally. Just like Genesis 2, and you get this warning of what will happen if you disobey, right. you get the same thing with Israel. Yep. This contingent language, if you obey me, and you're like, oh, no, mm. <laughs> I know where this story is yeah. going to go. 
And so Israel's function in this role is contingent upon her obedience. A couple other things. The Abrahamic covenant isn't contingent, but the Mosaic covenant is. So we talk about difference between a conditional and an unconditional covenant, right? Yeah, absolutely. And to me, this adds more tension into the plot line because now God not only, not that he has to, but he's chosen, he's you know Mm self-imposed. God has to fix the problem of the fall of man. Mm -hmm. Now he's got to fix the problem of Israel too. It gets complicated as it goes by, but Mm -hmm. the Abrahamic covenant is going to stand, of course, later the Davidic covenant. But there would be a kingdom of priests, which reminds us that the nations were always in God's mind as far as the kingdom. The kingdom of priests were to reach the other nations, the Absolutely. Gentiles. Yes, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And, and this is interesting. If I'm looking at the order of the stories here, Genesis 11 is Babel. God scattered the nations. Mm-hmm. The very next account is God calling Abraham through whom he will bless the nations. Mm. So God's God's heart towards the nations yeah. is restoration. Even after judgment, his after heart judgment. is for reaching them, reconciling with them. Yeah, pretty amazing. It shows the heart of God. Now, you asked about the tabernacle fitting into this too. And, you know, the way I visualize this, you've got this special land that Israel's going to go into. If you look at the camp of Israel You've got the Levites around the tabernacle. You have God's glory dwelling over top of this tent. And the furnishings are decorated with pomegranates and palm trees and cherubim, Mm. which reminds you of the Garden of Eden. Mm. And you have this visible cloud where, in essence, heaven and earth are coming together. This one place on the earth where God meets with man And you have Israel, and the camp is holy. If I have to use the bathroom, i got to go outside the camp Mm. if I'm defiled. In other words, nothing that defiles can enter in. Mm. Reminds me of Revelation 21 and 22. And so it's like God set up this little microcosm of what he ultimately intends to do with Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Mm. Well, Dr. King, as you know, Israel didn't do such a great job accomplishing her calling as a kingdom of priests. Would you explain? You know, I mean, I'm not condemning Israel because I'm an Adam descendant as well, but here's Moses in the middle of God's program here in Exodus where you get these instructions on how to build the tabernacle. Moses is up there on the mountain, and you get the golden calf happening down Mm -hmm. below. And so Israel's track record has been bad from the beginning. When you come into the book of Judges, already in Deuteronomy, God says, well, you're going to disobey me, and I'm going to judge you. You come into Judges... And you get this picture, like in Judges 19, that is a story very much like Genesis 19 in Sodom and Gomorrah. Hmm. So the author of Judges is showing you the canonization of Israel. You've got someone who's willing to do child sacrifice because he doesn't understand the nature and character of God, Hmm. Jephthah. You have this canonization. And so the author of Judges wants you to see we are a mess from the beginning. And then interestingly, in Judges, there's four times on this last section, and and the two bookends of that section would say, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Mm. Everyone did what's right in their own eyes. Now, the two middle occurrences of that just say they did what was right in their own eyes. The author is hinting to the reader, what we really need is a king. When I come into Samuel, we find that there's this prophecy from Hannah of this coming anointed one, which is the first time in text where this figure is called the anointed one. So the problem from the beginning, Israel was walking away from the Lord. God saw that in Israel. Solomon is the guy who really crystallizes this, and he's known for his wisdom, his wealth, and his wives. Mm -hmm. Of course, Dr. Weaver, you know the text. If I'm looking at Deuteronomy 17 and I'm looking at 1 Kings 10, Kings are not supposed to multiply wives or riches or gold or horses. And those are the very things that Solomon does in 1 Kings 10 through 11. And of course, the author of Kings is trying to say, this guy is not walking in Torah. So I'm expecting this to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Idolatry comes in through Solomon's wives, and it just unravels from there until Israel is taken away in captivity. As we wrap up this podcast in our discussion of the grand narrative of Scripture. Specifically, we're focusing on the grand narrative, the section of Scripture known as the Pentateuch. How does the Pentateuch finish? We've had a lot of bad endings so far, right? Where are we at in the storyline? How does the Pentateuch finish, and what kind of expectation does it end with? Some people like John Selhammer, they talk about how the Pentateuch really has an eschatological posture. It's looking forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's dead on because... 
what you find, for example, Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah. So there's this expectation of this coming Judahite king to rule over the nations and have this kingdom on earth characterized by creation blessing. Okay, when I come into Numbers and the Balaam oracles, this is fascinating as well. Numbers 24, Balaam talks about that which is going to befall Israel at the end of days. Same phrase as Genesis 49 and the prophecy of Jacob at the end of days. Uh, yeah, Numbers 24, 14. And when he's talking about this, verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, a scepter. So he's building on Genesis 49. He does that in more than this text here. A scepter shall arise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab. Hmm. Now, this is interesting. And then he says in verse 19, one from Jacob shall have dominion and destroy the remnant from the city. But you get Moab pictured as the serpent mm -hmm. and you get this one from Israel pictured as the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've already seen this in Genesis 49 and Genesis three. So that's interesting. Deuteronomy, I think is the most important mm -hmm. when it comes to this future look. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy four is eschatological. Deuteronomy 18, Moses says, the Lord, your God will raise up a prophet like me. Mm -hmm. The new Testament picks up on that. Are you that prophet? John chapter one and John the Baptist is like, no, that's not me. But Jesus is that one, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this prophet like Moses that speaks with God face to face. And you get that. But you also see in Deuteronomy 31, verse 29, Moses is going to tell Israel in a song what's going to happen after he dies. But he says this, I know that after my death, you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you. Here it is in the latter days, but literally in the Hebrew, it's the same phrase, at the end of days. For you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. Talking about idolatry. And what you have in Deuteronomy 32 is the song of Moses. This is quoted by Paul in Romans 10 and Romans 15. It's quoted by Paul in Philippians chapter 2. It's quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. And what they're doing in the New Testament is they understand where they're at in history mm -hmm. based on Song of Moses. Mm -hmm. Looking at the end of days and what's going to happen here, if you read Deuteronomy 32, is that Israel is going to rebel against God. God is going to set them aside. I'm kind of using my theological language here, but that's the picture. And he's going to bring in the Gentiles to make them jealous. This is Romans 9 through 11. Mm. We're also told in Deuteronomy 30 that after a period of captivity, God would bring Israel back and he would give them a circumcised heart. Mm. So what that gives us, this is huge. If I'm looking at the Pentateuch collectively, I get this picture of this coming. I'm going to use our terms here, Messiah to mm -hmm. reign. Genesis 49, Numbers 24. I get this period of Israel being set aside under judgment, Gentiles brought in to make them jealous, and then the Jews brought back in. I get Israel's restoration with the new covenant. That's where it ends up going. So there is a vast amount of eschatology found mm. in Pentateuch. I, I think really every piece of Israel's eschatological framework is there. Mm. The rapture is not there because right. we're not Israel. Church isn't there. <laughs> That's right. Very interesting. A lot of great points here as it relates to not Joshua and Judges and Ruth, but eschatological like you say we're going to see in the next podcast the conquest so there's still a nation coming out of egypt and they don't have a land they have a, a seed but they don't have the prophet or the one who will come from the seed who will crush the serpent and we don't have a king yet we're not just looking forward to like the end of days mm -hmm. like there's an immediate storyline being followed mm -hmm. and it just takes us right into joshua and judges well, that's a great place to close this podcast. We'll continue that next week. We'll have to leave our discussion here because our time is up for today's Bible and Theology Matters podcast, but we will continue our discussion in next week's podcast on the grand narrative of Scripture. We'll continue to follow this grand narrative through Scripture. Next week, Dr. Keene will return to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast to discuss the storyline from the conquest of the land of Israel through the exile of Israel and Judah, also known as the period of captivity. You won't want to miss it. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please like this podcast on whatever podcast platform you use to listen to this. Leave us a five-star review if you would. 
This will help our podcast become more visible and accessible to those who are seeking faith building programming. Also check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel entitled Bible and Theology Matters. And if you'd like to take the entire course that Dr. Keene teaches at a bachelor's level with Ethnos 360 Bible Institute, please visit e360bible.org. They offer a free course. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we do a condensed version of our Grand Narrative course and also several other free courses. And those are just made as a resource for the general public. They're free. Mm-hmm. And it's just at learn.e360bible.org. It's a great resource. Great. Learn.e360bible.org. Awesome. And if you'd like to take a full length course on this subject at a master's level, with Dr. Keene or the president of Dallas Seminary, Dr. Mark Yarbrough, visit dts.edu to enroll. That's dts.edu. Well, until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.